Hey. Hey, man. How you doing? Good. Good. How goes it? Yeah, I'm good. It's great to great to chat to you like this. Yeah, it's pretty insane. Like technology. I'm just checking the vibe here, but how awesome is it that we can like use this time to link up? I know, right? And uh, just like connect dots that normally wouldn't connect. Yeah, and it's like we're, we're both so busy. It's like at this point, we're all at home. It's like everyone's at home. Yeah. yeah. How's everything? You know, How's the right. transmission? You hear me well? Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing you great. Perfect. Nah, yeah, super man. excited. Can you see me? Is my head in the frame? Um, yeah. Perfect. I mean, I'm pretty kind of close up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you're in, like, for context, uh, where are you at right now? Uh, I'm in London. Yeah, just at my house, which is kind of like on the outskirts of London. Nice. Yeah. Ch Where are you? Chicago. Chicago. Yeah. Okay. Chicago, cool. Chicago. Camped out. Haven't been traveling for what, like, three weeks now. I feel like. Oh wow. Where were you at when sort of like the the doomsday scenario hit? Well, this is the weird thing. I was the scenario hit just as the ancestors were about to start touring. So when everything kind of started shutting down, it was the period that I was on my break. So I was at home anyway. <laughs> I just kind of didn't <laughs> start touring again. Yeah. What about it's you? It's insane. Like, had we known, like, everyone made all these, like, plans. Yeah. And, like, the summer came to us. How many shows did you get in? Um, well, we didn't start the tour. So, like, the tour is supposed to start on the 23rd of March. And around, like, the 13th, it just shut down. Yeah. You know? That's but you annoying. know, I've been thinking about this and it's like normally we release an album and we, we tour it. And it's like we in the audience discover the music while we're on the road playing it and kind of doing our thing. This time, like everyone gets a chance to just process the actual recorded music, you know, like the, the artifact that is the album. There's something kind of exciting I like about that. That yeah. it's not like we're giving that live energy and people are like kind of considering what the album is in the context of our live performance all they have is that that document the you know the album yeah which is super important i feel like that your live shows you know uh, fall into a space that's not so much just like going to a concert and hearing songs that you know mm. it's more like a conversational i thought yeah. that when I saw you play in Austin, Texas, which was like crazy, like a year ago, I guess we could probably frame up how we met <laughs> <laughs> for everyone tuning in. Super crazy. I've been a fan of the music, known about the music. And we were, we were in the hotel lobby at Austin, Texas, South by Southwest. And just your, I never saw you, but I knew by your presence who you were, which is crazy. Oh, uh yeah, I kind of saw you and I was like, you know what, I, I, I'd seen that you tweeted the, just the name Sons of Kemet about a year before. Yeah. So I was like, he definitely knows about the band. I'm just going to go up to him and say, you know, what's happening? Yeah. You know, uh, and then, you know, I told you about the gig and you came down, which is great. Yeah. yeah. Brought some friends, organic link up, that's how it should be. Yeah. I'm excited about the topic that you, you, you threw together for this. Mm. Yeah, just looking at how we, we both organize ourselves within these structures and i've been thinking a lot about what i meant about that topic um and what i mean by by structures like what is the structure that we you know structures can be this you know kind of disintegrated but what's the one thing that we're stuck in and i think that thing is history is the thing that we're both trying to navigate in some way you know and that's not yeah. like long history from a far place it's history as in what's just happened how do you relate to the immediate and the far past you know and for yeah. me, like, the, asking those questions is what's formed all of my music. You know, yeah. just the act of actually saying, how do I relate to American jazz that's happened before? And it's, and it's, it's constantly kind of, um, I don't know, it's constantly dying. It's, it's constantly creating new things that don't need to be created anymore. How do I relate to that from someone that's not even within the culture? Yeah. You know, and it's like the answers are the pro are the things that you hear on the records like sons of kemet or the comets coming off rapping the ancestors yeah do you this is a question before i even answer it i, I want to toss it to you do you do you have a pleasant relationship with the past construct of your art or is it like tumultuous um 
No, I've got a great relationship with it. You know, I, I, as in like when I, when I go back to what I've worked on in the past, it just feels like a part of me that's, that's over that I can then have a conversation with. I can learn from it. Even if it's something that I'm not totally happy with, it's like a conversation with just a moment in time. Yeah. And then I can think about what was happening around, around that, that moment. It's like, this is how I feel about all music. It's, it's a document. You know, yeah. it's that some of the documents make you move and I'm feeling certain ways, but they're all just ways of us archiving what's happening at that moment in our artistic life. So yeah. some things I, I love that I've done more for how they make me feel about where I was when I was recording them than the music themselves. Yeah. yeah. One of the things obviously that'll come up through our talk is a, is a little bit, is obviously about like where we come from and you know, how it relates to the continent of Africa, how it relates to the outside world. Mm. But within jazz and your, your sort of dialogue with the history of jazz, it being a sort of black art form, does that, does that make it, in terms of like dealing with like a purist of jazz or mm. a tourist of jazz, how does that affect what your um, work does and how you how you investigate it the fact that you're sort of dissecting a black art form mm. well i mean i feel like the diaspora has a has a mission like there's got to be some point in there being a diaspora like there being a scattered amount of african um people around the world and for me that that mission is to cast perspective on both e and on both our, our art forms as a communal group and the music of Africa. So me relating to jazz is me casting my perspective on the art form of jazz. And that's all I have to offer. You know, it's, it's for me, it's really simple. It's like, all I can offer you is how I see the music that has been played before and what, what I see is important or significant in it. And that significance is what I find is significant comes from my personal history. You know, I might listen to a Sonny Rollins solo and what I see is as significant as him playing the outro and jamming on one note. And I might go, you know, that all that harmonic stuff was amazing, but that bit he did at the end with that one note thing, that's what I want to base my entire solo on next time. Yeah. And it's this constant, yeah, dialogue in, the, in that sense, in that it's, yeah, just seeing what, yeah, resonates with me from a historical point of view. You know? Yeah. Because where it ties into the work that I do is a bit like, you know, it's funny to have, just even hearing you explain that and the comparing and contrast of a different field. So for all of our followers listening at home, I guess we should do like the introduction. <laughs> I was thinking, because it's cool to share this, but I want to make sure everyone gets the most out of the conversation. Uh, I'm Virgil Abloh. I design, I make artworks. I altogether try to be creative. Um, you're Shabaka Hutchings. Um, you give yourself your own sort of qualifications. Uh, I play the clarinet, the saxophone, and I'm, a, I'm an instrumentalist who yeah. I play in the band Sons of Kemet, the comet is coming, Shabak and the Ancestors. And I've been a part of the London jazz scene for, for a while now. I grew up, I was born in England, grew up in Barbados, and moved back to England at 16. And it's like my career has been a process of trying to learn from learn from all the musics that i've encountered along the way and somehow connect all the dots together you know gotcha. the products have been the music that i you know that i come up with yeah and for me my parents are from ghana and west africa they moved to chicago had me and my sister and since then i've been on this journey to to sort of express my findings in the realm of art architecture, fashion, and just in a broad stroke, creativity. But what I found, obviously, as like a young kid growing up is that, you know, in a bit of a ways, and I want to ask you specifically, is like the art music, especially particularly jazz being a black art form, you're entering it with a sort of, uh, sort of on a level ground, so to speak, when when I was young, sort of expressing myself or investigating art, architecture, fashion, I noticed that there was a, this barrier 
mm. that was sort of in a way like depicted based on sort of your outer look, you know, your expression, like where are you from? And the sort of canons of sort of that world of creativity is, doesn't usually include Africa or mm. Africa in the same way or, you know, I'm American, so black American as well. So I found that I was having to sort of do in the same way, sort of investigating the sort of art form, but incorporating a new perspective, which thankfully brought me here today, but is sort of what makes me unique in sort of the investigations that I'm doing now all the way forward. Mm. I mean, it's like, me, it's like the, the investigation of the past is, is, is that that's the future in yeah. that everything that I do in going back or everything that I guess we do in going back is just maybe it's, it's almost like it's, you're trying to nuance the past. You're trying to make the past an organic, an organic matter. So whenever I've found people that have been or found artists that I've, you know, I've talked to and they seem to be stuck in, in some kind of rut, intellectual rut or artistic rut, it feels like they see the past as something that's, that's finite that has a stop point and they're trying to race toward, like they're trying to grasp uh, a past that has been formed and they don't know how to quite kind of like articulate themselves around it. Whereas for me, I'm seeing the past as something that I have a conversation with, you know? So if I think back to my time in Barbados uh, between six and 16, I'm trying to think about what were the musical events, what were the kind of just musical feelings that I had but with the the vision that I have now, being you know being from London, having all those influences, yeah, you know? yeah. So, now, yeah. very mm -hmm. much the same. I think like, um, it, you know, a lot of what sort of has come sort of my recent investigation, especially starting at Louis Vuitton and my first show, sort of trying to articulate that that realm of fashion can have uh, a different muse is that within fashion and art, there's a sort of, there's a different set of canons that uh, like a black expression within art and fashion have than a European one. Mm. Um, and sort of being my relationship with the past is sort of is, it's valuable, it's the foundation, it's equally important. But within those realms, those sort of sacred realms of like high fashion or high art, there, there needs to be the canons of like a black expression need to be written now more than just the practice of putting out new work. Mm. Um, and those are, you know, this is like, this is a quarantine edition of, of this new idea, jazz hours that I was uh, thinking about. Whereas like, you know, this pause in sort of society for me has allowed not just being busy with doing more work as I normally would have been doing, have this virus pandemic not sort of ruled the world. It's a little bit about a derivative higher and thinking about what new strides can us sort of viewing the past sort of be more poignant and going to the future. Mm. And the text that you said, a part of our required reading, I think it would be a good point to sort of uh, reread that. Maybe show people that book, because I got a lot of requests. Do you have it within arm's reach? Yeah, the Morton Feldman. So it's um, Morton Feldman, Collected Writings of Morton Feldman. Give my regards to Ape Street. Yeah. Maybe explain that the, the quotes that you underlined and we can run through that. Yeah, so we've got, the composer's surface is an illusion into which he puts something real, sound. The painter's surface is something real from which he then creates an illusion. Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah. About? Yeah, and he's talking to, you know, actually I'll just read the, um, the, the passage before that. That might actually give a little bit more context. He's talking to his friend, he said, I was thinking about this. I called my friend Brian or Dirty. Brian, I asked, what is the surface of music I'm always talking to you about? How would you define or describe it? Um, not being a composer or knowing much about music, he was hesitant to answer. 
after a while he said the composer's surface is an illusion into which you put something real which is the sound the painter's surface is something real which then he creates an illusion of you know so he's saying like the musician you know he's starting with that point of view with that essential thought that essential you know feeling atmosphere that then he finds a tangible you know sound collection of notes to actually you know kind of form it with with the painter starts with the material you know, it's like they're guided by that tangible thing that exists already and then that kind of sculpts the way that they you know their brain that sculpts their their thoughts and their expression yeah which to me like boils down to the impression of when i went to your show you know like listening to you and your band perform there's this sort of i feel like the key word is like humanity allows to like you will it's almost like you're allowed to dream in real time you know mm. there's no like obviously it's not something of like a rap concert or like a, a lyric driven thing where you're going and you're reciting the lyrics and you're happy to hear what you hear in your ipod live where your realm of jazz it's like you know it's a it's an abstract comp comp composition of notes that is hypnotic in a way mm. I mean, and to the quote that you were saying it's like you know it's a, the illusion that sort of allows that sort of trip to take place and a little bit of what you know i'm at in my practice with fashion is sort of like uh, what was his description of what like a paint a canvas was that it's like finite he says music has a surface that constructs with time um oh here it is the composer's surface is an illusion into which he puts something real which is sound the painter's surface is something real which he then creates an illusion of exactly and i think mm. that quote highlights a little bit of my newfound tension with fashion or mm. less art objects when i make those but fashion it's like it, it's a little bit too literal of a you know it's that's why i'm glad it's only like one piece of the pie of my whole practice but i've often thought that it's a it's a, like an emotional dead end to make a million t-shirts mm -hmm. you know or to make pants <laughs> to put them in a series of combinations and let them walk down a runway doesn't begin to tell a wide enough of a story just just in its own practice obviously that's why my fashion shows have gotten a little bit more abstract they're com combining music they're telling different stories and it's the world around the the actual clothing that is painting my full picture but a little bit about our overarching concept about like sort of like the black expression is that i'm now realizing that sort of discrepancy is that there hasn't been the canons of black expression sort of widely spread around the world for people to truly understand the nuances that are within the sort of overall expression. Mm. I mean, that's why like striking. Mm. That's one of the things I think about just the trend that's happening now in jazz, where we're starting to see people who wouldn't have 10, 15 years ago identified as jazz fans, starting to see that it's music that has a connection beyond that genre. You yeah. Know? Like when we say the word jazz, like it's, it's almost like when you use your quotation marks every time i hear the word jazz it comes with two quotation marks <laughs> and those quotation marks it like it depicts one the person who i'm i'm speaking the word to so that yeah. could be all the history that they have if i'm talking to someone who has a limited history of the music my saying the word jazz could mean music that they eat dinner to you know it could mean music that they've seen played by all men in pubs <laughs> you know, if I'm talking to someone who knows about the developments of the music, it could mean a totally different thing. It could mean like the vanguard, it could mean protest music, you know, it could mean yeah. like the peak of black expression. So for me, that's, that's the important thing, or like considering the quotation mark in who you're like, who you're trying to give these messages to, like even when I'm referring to the music. And I, I feel like the audience today 
has started to appreciate that there is a quotation mark yeah you know, as opposed to just seeing the word in itself like say yeah i i don't like jazz or i think jazz is this type of music they're kind of looking at listening to it and going i'm starting to see how this relates to everything that these performers are hearing like everything that surrounds them yeah yeah you know? and that's you're hitting on sort of obviously the the, the connection point when both of our practices is that you know early often when i realized that obviously my voice but obviously this this sort of level of like intellectual thinking on a creative practice within a black art form doesn't have a formalized sort of like education base you know there's not a sort of like widely understood and accepted set of uh things that have happened in sort of black creativity that are taught in schools from London, England, Japan, et cetera. Mm. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't sit in the same sort of foundation as everything I learned from, you know, my art, uh, architecture school and engineering and everything before it. And, you know, I employed this language of using quotation marks to sort of speak in layers mm. rather than, you know, speaking in sort of uh, exact definitions, because my ideas and the history of my ideas and the history that comes with my skin color is, is influences how people receive the work. You know, that's what we mean for one, but B allows an understanding of where these ideas come from. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the quotation marks are a powerful sort of like modernist tool and by modernist i mean like 2020 going forward of of communicating different ideas at different levels not being so monotonous and and allowing discrepancy to sort of shape a future vision mm. i mean this is going into that realm of of this realm of, of spirituality that I've been talking to a lot of people in South Africa about, you know, like even the guys in my band, Shabak and the Ancestors, when they talk about the, the tenets of ancestral worship as practiced today, you know, by people in, in South Africa, they're talking about a circular approach to time where things aren't happening on a linear level where one person experiences knowledge or experience throughout their lifetime and then at the end of their life, it, it, it ends. It's, there's a circular kind of mode of knowledge. So knowledge forms keep on repeating and showing themselves in various different, you know, different levels. You know, so it's like the, 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 what I'm doing in relation to what, you know, Louis Armstrong was doing in relation to what, you know, his forefathers were doing in relation to what people are doing in Africa is happening in a trajectory that loops around on itself. You know, and yeah. if you can see the kind of the shortest point of that in those loops, like the point from one end to another is, is shorter than kind of going around in a spiral. You know, so it's, it's almost like if you're trying, we're trying to look into history with the knowledge that the history is still present and it becomes present by us actually manifesting it in, in various different ways through trying to just employ it with a perspective gained from like the now. You know, yeah. and for me that the hard part is actually understanding what is now like what is the present you know it's like the coronavirus is a good is an amazing metaphor for that i feel like there was a point especially in england and the us where there was any reluctance to accept what the present was yeah. the present being we are within a pandemic and our <laughs> governments need to sort it out need to like accept that and do the necessary precautions you know it's like they're living in the past they're living in an ideal version of the reality, a reality that they are trying to project onto, you know, onto the population, whereby the present is a virus passing through the entire, <laughs> the entire population. Yeah. So it's like we're always we're trying to actually have a grasp of what's happening in the present, what's actually being happening now, so that when we refer to the past, it collides with our knowledge of you know, of, of what's happening now. And it creates, the, for me, that creates the future. That yeah. creates the, the kind of music or the kind of thinking um, that people define as, as futurist, uh, people define as forward thinking. Yeah, you know? I love this train of thought because in my practice, you know, there's an obsession with like 
new, right? Mm. And, you know, with just being specific within like fashion or art, like if I post an image of like a white t-shirt, right? You know, just dumbing it down or generic, yeah, yeah. making it super generic, like the innate sort of context of inserting that into now from the past is like that white t-shirt has been done a million times. Like, you know, have you, haven't you seen that white t-shirt before? But, and I'm, you know, I'm a proponent of dispelling this myth of, of obviously like being focused on it being inventive to the point where it's never been seen before. Do you, your relationship with the past or sort of investigating the past, like how do you acknowledge like the, the, the canons of the past in your work as you sort of investigate it and break it apart and offer something new? Well, it's just different, it's different ways of, of seeing the past as in different ways of perceiving it, different ways of considering it. So that's my, that's my kind of relationship with the past. It's how do I actually go towards it? Am I going towards it thinking, I know what's coming, I just need to learn something technically from it? Or am I going towards it saying, I really wanna, I want it to change me. I want it to continually change me. Because I do think that, you know, I'll be talking about the past in a very general term. We're not kind of giving any specifics, but I think yeah. that there are some universal aspects to the, I don't know, the, the, undif the, the uncontained nature of information. You know, like there, there's so many ways of perceiving things. So it's yeah. not just about, do you know what's happened in the past? It's about how do you react to that, that thing in the past? You can have a white t-shirt that you display to someone and they can say, I've seen a white t-shirt a hundred times. I don't need to see a white t-shirt. But then you might say to them, have you thought about a white t-shirt in more ways than one? Exactly. And it's that second way of thinking about a, a white t-shirt that I'm trying to get you to do. So you're seeing the same thing that you've seen in a multitude of days before, but you're thinking about it in a, in a completely different way. And that's my relation to the past. It's not about what you're seeing or hearing. It's about how you're considering it in relation to your present. Yeah. And the more you learn about your present, the more you're able to actually depict the past in a way that has some kind of um, bearing that makes any sense. Yeah. yeah. Now, as you were just using those words, I was thinking through it, like within my practice, and obviously the the sort of main bullet point, if we were putting post-it notes of bullet points of this sort of discourse, is is the idea that within black art or black fashion, there isn't a sort of formalized canon yet, you mm -hmm. know, and like something as sort of basic as a white tee. Obviously there's, you know, I just finished this documentary uh, in his own words, it's like uh, Martin Margiela sort of explaining his past and how he was sort of discovering things which, you know, are immediately like inserted into the canon of fashion, you know, without, with good cause, but you know, that's the canon, it's there. And so things like taking a ready-made object and converting that into fashion is attributed to him, the meaning also is bestowed to that logic of thinking. But I was just thinking about how within obviously black fashion and the lineage of and the history of it, there's like a, there's a song from the franchise boys called White Tea. Mm. And it was this era in the nineties of, of obviously the white tea in black culture means like uh, undoubtedly crisp, you know? It's a basic item that costs maybe $3, but every day of the summer, if you wear a fresh white tea, it, it means that you're like cleaner than clean, fresher than fresh. Mm. And this song sort of in Atlanta exhibited like the oversized white tea, you know, extreme is a tall tea. So super big, super, so it was like the bigger the white tea, the, the more value that you get out of it. And, inserting inserting that you know that's where the quotation marks come into play so if i'm sort of iterating on this white tea in the design studio and i and i'm playing i know that there's a sort of canon within european fashion that exudes that emotion but i also have this history that has been largely undocumented so that's where i play in the realm of merging both sentiments into like 
a new future expression, which is, which is where I find my freedom, where I find my voice. Like mm. being specific about your past, who, who were the same, just sort of the, the listeners in on the conversation, when you reference past and jazz, who is the sort of, who are the canons for you? So for me, it's like, first of all, I, I played the tennis saxophone. So the first point of contact is, is John Coltrane, Pharaoh Sanders, Sonny Rollins, um, Sam Rivers, um, just the people that you would acknowledge as the kind of great, you know, like carriers of the, of the torch. And it feel like I've got a different relationship to each of those, of those players, you know, in relation to when I started listening to them. So someone like Pharaoh Sanders, when I started listening to him, I wasn't as much of a fan as I am now. My relationship with him has grown. The same with John Coltrane, with, uh, same as same with Miles Davis, with certain periods of his, of his career. I feel like I go towards these artists and I, I grow with them. And, you know, like a, a, a person like Louis Armstrong, when I started listening to him, I knew that he was supposed to be a great, but I was listening to him being a, a, a kid in Barbados, you know? Yeah. I, and I, I was into Calypso, I was into reggae, um, hip hop, but this was like the mid nineties. So I'm into hip hop. I'm into like Bone Thugs, E-40, Tupac, you know, um, yeah. Outkast. And I, I hear this jazz music and I'm just like, I don't know what this is. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to hear it. It's not, it's not doing <laughs> anything for me. You yeah. Um, the things that change that is my, is my seeing the music life, my engagement with it as an actual, you know, like, living living thing like when i moved to england one of the first people i met was soweto kinch who was running the jam session um he was doing some jazz interspliced with hip-hop and the experiments at that time but then still playing straight ahead jazz with real like real fire you know yeah in some ways when i think back it was a real like privilege to be able to be in that environment i seen someone really playing jazz um with a kind of fire that I could identify from the reggae performer. Yeah. You know, so when I think of someone like Sisla or Capleton or Anthony B jumping on stage in the Caribbean, I see someone who is like hyped up, who wants to see that crowd, you know, like bursting out of the stadium, you know, like maybe an equivalent is someone like Travis Scott. Who yeah. When you see, when, as soon as he touches that stage, you know that what he's trying to do to that audience is elevate. You know, yeah, is they want every single person to be feeling a, a group, like a communal sense of elevation. You know, exactly. no one can be left behind. And for me, that's something that really resonates with me and, and Caribbean performers. When you get those like, those soca monarch competitions, where it's about who can, you know, you're trying to get the whole crowd to jump up, jump up, jump up, jump up. And it's like, you're getting that consistent thing and everyone is kind of going up. So when I, when I moved to England and I started to see that there was jazz being played with that same spirit, the spirit of we're going to make every single person in this room move. Yeah. I started to listen back to the jazz recordings that I had heard before and was like, you know, the only image in my head was like what I'd seen on TV, which is maybe jazz being played in cocktail bars or yeah, not with any music kind of, music. yeah. And it really connected that thing that it is, it is a black art form that has black aesthetics to it, you know. And by black aesthetics, I mean aesthetics that stretch beyond the, the capitalist mode that it's framed in. Aesthetics that, that speak to communality, that yeah. speak to some level of, of depth in terms of spiritual um, upliftment. And, you know, by spiritual upliftment, I just, I mean, you know, music where it, it elevates a, a, a part of you that is un, unquantifiable. Yeah. You know, everyone individually know, will know what that means to them. You know, it's, it's like no one can tell you. And it, you know, it's not a specific type of music. There's music where when you listen to it, you feel energized. You know, for me, I interpret that as a spiritual expression, you know. And as soon as I start to see the connection in that expression throughout various either art forms or type of music, then I start to see like the, the connection of people because people are the, you know, people are the, the beings that are doing this, this, this thing, you know? Yeah. So like, if I, if I hear a jazz musician raise a crowd to a level where everyone is like, I can't understand what's happening, but I'm just going to scream. And then I yeah. go to a rock concert 
and see someone do the same thing. It gives me like this faith that we're all trying to do essentially the same thing, which is have a communion with people and like yeah. move ourselves out of the out of the present. The question is for me then, where do we go? Are we trying to go out the present into the past or into the future? And I think there's a way of doing it all together, and that's when you get deep music or deep experiences in, in general. When it's yeah. not about whether your frame of reference is the past the present or the future when it's all of those things combined you know yeah which is like you know when we talk about like our ancestry and the the way our communities relate to each other you know this whole content continent of africa and the the sort of second nature of the soul that's in the earth that comes through the people and the music the expression the way they talk the way they express themselves i think in an essence we're we're a part of that tribe that's traveling the world, working in different art forms, putting that ancestry on display in different art forms, you know, as like a baseline. And I think that like ignoring sort of race and the place that we are, I always look at it as like humanity's goals to like further our existence, right? Mm -hmm. And be more awakened as we do that because we have the ability to look at the past and see what missteps humanity has taken and to sort of like look at those with fresh eyes and say hey let's let's re reanalyze how we relate to the environment let's reanalyze how we relate to people of different genders or different sexual orientation and i think you know i'm an optimist so i firmly believe that our generation almost was on an amazing path before this sort of like wave of like political sort of uh sort of pendulum swing brought us back with what you know brexit in the u uh, in the uk and you know with our recent sort of like engagement of our administration between the obama years and the these current years mm. but do you feel like us being sort of artists in the positions that we are in, I formally do, but I wonder if you feel the same as like this tension and these epiphanies make it like our renaissance to create the in our pocket that we do. Do you feel that like that like open road and that optimism in your practice? Yeah. I mean, my I have to have optimism because music is my life. You know, so if I don't have optimism about music and the health of the music scene, it means that I'm not optimistic about the future of myself. You know, and wow, for me, yeah. the, the future of myself starts with me believing that there is a future. You know, and assuming that there's a future is like, if I, if I sit down to compose a tune and I think there's a possibility of me not having any ideas, then I can guarantee I'm going to think about that possibility and all that time of thinking is going to be time that I could have been creating. You know, yeah. for me that, and you know, as soon as like those thoughts come in, I, I stop, I do, do something else, run, walk around the block, whatever. But for me, it's about just accepting that, you know, we, we have some, we always have something to give, you know, we, we have, we always have some, some, you know, some way of navigating our situation that can be of benefit to either ourselves or to others. It's yeah. just about act, more, kind of like accepting that. And that's the state of the music scene, the music industry. It's about how we, how we are dealing with it on a, you know, in some ways on a, just on a personal level. Yeah. Can you speak to, this is something that definitely I wonder, and, and sort of the people that follow me, I'm glad that we're building this bridge between uh, typical musical tastes of like a 17 to 27 year old to where we're at in London. Have you seen the jazz scene and the community around jazz in, in your career, has, is it growing? Do you feel it like sort of converting new minds and the shows are sort of like adopting a wider, younger audience or older? Or how does it feel being insular within your scene? Mm, I feel like we, we've gotten a young audience, like a core young audience that knows what the music's about. They know that when they come to the, the shows, it's a it's a physical thing they, they're free to do whatever they want they don't have to dance 
but there's a group there's going to be some kind of forward momentum there that you know that allows them to move themselves if they want but there's also that to that side of the audience that might be older that they want to listen to music with detail they want to hear interaction they want to hear they want to hear the connection to the history um, and be taken from the journey from the start to the set to the end and for me the you know there's a there's been that shift in jazz being a music for the list the the listener that would consider themselves to be discerning you know the listener that considers themselves to be um, a listener of music that's not necessarily about the body, that's about the head. Yeah, you know, so now they kind of listen open. to it like this? <laughs> exactly. And for me, I'm like, you know what? I want to make something for those guys or those ladies as well. You know, yeah. it can be everything. You know, it's about the, 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 how you perceive the music, how you're, what, what you're coming to the music with. You yeah. Know, it's like a make of music that, you know, 18-year-old kids can just be kind of like moshing to. But yes. then someone can be in the back and listening to it and actually kind of getting an insight. You know, that's yeah. my ultimate, ultimate aim. That's my same, you're highlighting a little bit of the epiphany that I've had with my runway shows in the last two years or so. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a, a great friend and stylist, her name is Christine Centenera. And she, you know, before I got into fashion, you know, I'd spent 10 years going to shows and doing my sort of relation to the past, finding what I liked and finding, you know, who I related to. And, and she described this one Hader Ackerman show as like when the dresses came out, all the editors started crying, you know? And that, that was like an epiphany to me because I, in some ways, obviously like clothes are an inanimate object, right? You know, mm -hmm. they're just some things that you have, but to compose them in a way with color, shape, light, and how you present them with the, the sonics as the backdrop, you know, can, can literally evoke emotion and tears out of somebody's eyes. That sentiment obviously sent me on my current path about like pouring in a point of view that, you know, in my realm, it's like very stark, right? You know, me showing, I don't know how many shows I've done, maybe like 20, 30, so or whatever you know i do them in paris with specific reason and i you know i advocate them i come out at the end of the runway show because there needs to be an image of a young black kid presenting these ideas in the sort of canon of european fashion you know like that's mm -hmm. important that need that image needs to exist you know i can't be anonymous it needs to be presented but i firmly believe in the past and the canons of that so just the same way as your audience who's like in the back and i always make a joke in my design studios like they they do look at fashion or they look at entertainment with a with their their hand on their chin and looking to sort of be recalling the past that is the approved past mm -hmm. but obviously as i've matured into my role i you know even the beginning in january for instance i i had this a feeling that now the black identity needs to be formally fused into the sort of lineage that I've been creating by these, whatever, six years of doing shows within Paris. And I, I texted two people as I was like prepping, I'd come off a break um, and I, I texted Pop Smoke and West Side Gun, two artists in rap music, that you know in the months ending 2019 had sort of crafted two very important uh, voices within music and one of which was pop smoke basically connecting with london producers and bringing the sort of uk drill sound which started in chicago formalized itself in london and then mm. but there was always that bridge that had never been crossed within like sort of uk rap from grime or whatever like there's never been this sort of like this sort of sharing that was happening so that i thought was like you know monumentous you know and needed to be documented and so i was like hey you have to come to the shows and west side gun who sort of brought back this sort of like nostalgia of of 90s rap over soul samples but modernized it with like a uh, like a like a presence 
mixing the past and the future. And I was like, <laughs> you know, my sort of mood board on my mind was the black identity no longer has to sort of be in the retail stores, just sort of propping up brand names and making them pop culture and sort of nudging the trends forward on a commercial level. It needs to be fused on the front row amongst mm -hmm. the editors, amongst the, the sort of the establishment, because this 2020 period, it, it needs basically diamonds and chains back. You know, full expression of, of that canon needs to be fused into my work so that we can have exactly that same emotion that I saw when I went to your show. You know, I saw a young generation just sort of like almost mosh pit dancing, expressing themselves without thinking about their cell phone or thinking about being cool. They had tapped into sort of like a different expression of music. And then you had the discerning, it was like a BBC showcase or something like that. So you have, you know, discerning music industry coming to see what's going on. And I very much feel the same way about fashion, you know, mm. that my shows are a community gathering. Uh, you know, they're, they're just as much for the establishment as the kid who usually can't get into a fashion show. Let's spend seven minutes together sort of like sharing and then leaving that show having a different idea about fashion because you've had the collective experience. You saw, you saw, you know, rappers with diamond teeth and chains, like up close and personal. You know, I had a, a tap dancer by Car the name Cartier Williams, like do this sort of emotional performance. And, you know, but I, you know, I stood true to canons of tailoring and sort of, you know, my sort of icon in fashion, Pierre Cardin, and sort of was playing with the clothes and in an intellectual manner. And the overall expression felt like, you know, now my voice is fine tuned to an expression that does exactly what we're investigating. You know, mm. how, how does analyzing the past, but reinterpreting it in this amalgamation of ideas create emotion and become a future? Mm. It makes me think of this. I did a gig in, in Istanbul a couple of years ago and this guy came up to, to me afterwards and he said, I've, the feeling I had at your gig is a feeling that I've only before had at a football match. And that's the <laughs> feeling that he can just like open his mouth and let rip and like let go, you know? Yeah. Like he can shout all his frustrations, all of the tension in his body. He can do that. And he doesn't feel like anyone's for one gonna hear him because of the amount of sound, but no one's gonna <laughs> judge him for doing that either. Um, and, you know, I realized that's for me what it's about It's like, you know, like music is like the gym. It's like there's one space that people are operating in, but everyone could be doing a totally different thing. Yeah. You know, you might be in the gym next to some like hard knock yeah. that's just pumping and pumping, <laughs> but you might be there doing some kind of like, you know. Restrained. Restrained, <laughs> you, know, you know, like breathing techniques, for instance. Yeah. Um, and this is what the musical sphere is. Like a lot of the time, like we can talk intellectually about music and, it's, it's sometimes good to reflect about music in these terms, but a lot of times I'm on tour, I go on to stage and I'm like, I'm going to blow the saxophone so hard that someone is going to scream. <laughs> and that is where it, the intellectualism ends, you know? And it's like yes. this intellectualism in framing the performance so that the landmarks that can take us through a musical journey. But then myself within that, I'm going, I'm going to take the saxophone and I'm going to play so much saxophone that you are not going to be able to think about anything. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and I, I, I love that. I love that, that feeling that, you know, we're, we're doing different things. Someone might come to a concert to see a musical performance and you've got a guy on stage or a lady on stage going, I am not giving you a musical performance. I'm giving you a physical performance. You know, yeah. I'm giving you a physical, you know, exerting. Like if I take the saxophone, and I blow it as hard as possible for an hour and a half. It puts me into a trance. Yeah. And through that trance, I start to interpret reality in a different way. I start to start to form kind of correlations with elements of the past. And I start to feel what the audience, what, what the vibration of the audience is, what the, the atmosphere of the time is, you know, and I present that in, in the music. Um, and that's, that's it, you know, and there's all these, you know, and I think you know, what we're doing, this talk is actually helping me write like the next book 
that I've, I've decided that I want to do, which is sort of like framing these black canons with analyzing the past and seeing how that relates to the, the, the rest of the globe, right? Mm. You know, within art and fashion, especially, you know, in the American vein that, you know, I worked in come and understood through in from years of designing album covers or stages or, you know, learning about art by sort of engaging with it. There's always this sort of, you know, for all of what you know is, is the, the restrained, the restrainment, right? Mm. You just discussed it as like, I'm going to blow the saxophone so that it literally obliterates you know, the confines of like intellectualism that's like restrained. You know, we're going to go to a different realm because this, uh, you know, when you say that, I feel like it's coming from your soul. Yeah. You know, it's not a ploy. You know, this is Barbados. <laughs> this yeah. is music that you must have heard, you know, at six years old coming out of a car stereo. Mm. Not something you had learned in school as a way to articulate like uh, notes. Yeah, I mean, this actually leads us on to something I was going to say, but I, I lost that train of thought while you were talking, you know, a couple of minutes ago about the nature of the institution, the nature of the archive, you know, in, in relation to black forms of knowledge, forms of knowledge that have been passed from Africa to, our, to the diaspora throughout centuries. You know, there's, a, there's sometimes, uh, you know, are going towards the forms of institutionalizing knowledge that we, we've been used to within a Western context, you know. But and the interesting thing, you know, I think now, especially now that we've reached a point where all our institutions within society seem to have collapsed, it's about saying what are new forms of producing knowledge and new forms of sharing and, and storing knowledge, what are they going to be from now, you know. And exactly. if we see if every single person sees themselves as the potential to carry or um, share some form of knowledge, everyone individually has to find, you know, like find the answers for themselves in, in whatever, you know, capacity that can be. So for me, that's musically for you. It's, you know, I say music, for me it's musically and in whatever I, I come into contact with. Um, for you, it's your artwork, your DJ, your, your thinking. You know, yeah. as everyone that hears this is going to have some element, of, you know, in their life that has to do with creativity and archiving um, the process of, of knowledge that surrounds that creativity. Yeah. You know? So how do you, how do you take that to like an intellectually far degree outside of the institution? You know, yeah. is it possible to do the amount of studying that an institution like a university tells you is needed to get a master's degree without a master's degree and relating it constantly to your community and to the wider society, you know? Yeah. For me, these are the questions that are going to be asked, you know, with the fundamental change in society that, you know, for instance, this crisis is, is causing now. I know the fact that people are doing like online learning when they're yeah. probably supposed to have graduated to get their degree, you know, in a couple months, now has them sort of looking at their bookshelves like my friend Mafuz is like literally that person who you know you get this understanding in relation to to the formalized like like you just said like institutionalized learning but then you know the real work begins after you sort of like apply that to the real world and a little bit of the context of what we've been talking about is like you know, what's the future or defining the future. And I like to think when you speak about your concerts, those are like condensed, like condensed years of education learned in a, in a formalized setting, right? Yeah. Like it, it takes you through the idea of getting into a university, going to class and living plus like learning and handing in papers and doing homework and doing a final to your professor saying one thing that cracks your mind open, like the guy who you had that show in Istanbul, that sounds like two years of higher education. Mm. <laughs> if that, you know, to get that, to get that epiphany that, uh, you know, an hour and a half show of yours could transcend his mind to think about the world you know, in a different way when he leaves that concert mm. you know that's probably equivalent to two years of education you i know? mean 
there's some things that like the biggest lessons I've learned in my musical life, like I can tell you them right now. They've been lessons that someone has told me a phrase, a statement, mm -hmm. and it stayed with me with everything that I do. You know, one of those was um, there's a saxophone, a kind of free improvising legend saxophone player from, from Britain called Evan Parker. And I had a period where I did three gigs um, like in the presence of him in a week. So at the end of those three gigs, I went up to him and I was like, Evan, you've heard me play three times. I just want you to be honest with me. What do I need to do? Like, what's the, what's the next step to just improve myself on any level? You know? And he looked at me and he said, you need to play everything that you know. You need to play like whatever you think is the most, the thing that's going to get you the most impact in that present moment you play. You play, you play the thing that makes you think there's nothing else left. And then when you think there's nothing else left, you're going to realize there's a little bit somewhere else. Then you play that. And it's like you're constantly looking, searching towards, searching for the end. You know, you're constantly trying to say, okay, this is the last thing, definitely the last thing I can play. After that, there's nothing else. And then you realize there's always something else. You know, and actually, yeah. you can actually like compare that to your, you know, your ethos, like under construction. You yeah. know, the idea that there is no end. There is, there is always under construction, that the thought process of defining what what constitutes the end is is perpetual yeah it's, yeah. it's infinite you know there's there's no it, it's that pulling from within yourself that creates the new mm. you know there's there's less calculation it's just emotionally sort of searching that you yeah. that story recalls the same thing you know like and it's funny i'm a firm believer of like institutionalized sort of knowledge as a base but then obviously like your own survey of investigating and uh, the combination is what makes the richness you know mm. and, and allows you to properly have a dialogue with the past there has to be a knowledge of it mm. but there has to be like a feverish pursuit of as you were just saying like defining what you're finding you know packaging it up and moving on like two two sites that like equally like there was a the philosopher a writer, Kierkegaard, which talks about this idea of like transferring ideas from one person to another. It's just like rearranging, the, like giving someone the tools so that they can rearrange the furniture in their head mm. all to their own, you know, rather than me telling you where to put the furniture in your head, like create the context so that the epiphany happens. So things start to line up. Mm. So there was like, two modes, one mode, two different things. One of the required readings that I had was that uh, list of David Hammond's sort of like a just bullet point sort of like discussions. And then it was Louise Wilson, who was like the head of the MA, iconic professor at Central St. Martin's, whom I had met with, obviously, before I had been doing fashion formally or shows. And was, you know, that we had this like undying sort of it's a little bit of like the West, the, the, the formalized education voice on one shoulder and the sort of like, hey, I'm going to follow my own path. You know, based on where you're from, all of a sudden your, your natural hand starts to, you know, join materials together, you know. And he, what he said in this like interview that was like a huge epiphany to me was that in the south of America, but you know, around the world is like, you know, a, two do a door opening that comes together is always gonna be off in sort of Negro architecture. Mm. He's like, it still performs the exact same function of closing a room, but the, the joining of which it does expresses a different sort of emotion that comes from a hand. Mm. And, you know, I had always been thinking, you know, descendants of an African family studying in America and studying, you know, the Bauhaus. And then I was, you know, studying like architecture in the, the modernist sense, you know, I was obsessed and recalling the beauty that would come in sort of these like linear matchups, you know, very intellectual uh, minimalism. And mm -hmm. I was just reading that one quote sort of was the epiphany of going to all the high, you know, I've, I've done eight years of higher education and one, one friend sending me one interview was just emotion and observation, mm. and, you know, and, and it was like, obviously David Hammonds is 
he's broken through and become a canon of black art in in sort of like the 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 sort of classical sense like just delivering that quote for it to hit my ears has impacted my work in like great sort of lengths because it's it, and then that's what i think education is you know mm -hmm. it's it's not it doesn't have to be formal it doesn't have to be you know from an older brother passing it down it just has to ring true mm -hmm. I mean that's like my like my engagement with with education in itself i studied a classical degree you know i studied the clarinet um and when you know like when i was in barbados and i started music the and i played the clarinet so i did the kind of grades i did the the the, the usual kind of classical background but in addition to that i just played the instrument so i i jammed with my friends played in calypso bands whatever when i came to england I kept on studying the instrument and when it was time to go to do a university degree, I remember talking to Courtney Pine and asking him, you know, what should I, should I study jazz or should I study classical clarinet? And he told me, you're, the reason you're studying is to get as much knowledge of the, the history of, of, of um, education on that instrument as possible. You know, yeah. they've had a few hundred years of people being taught the clarinet you know you want to be a part of that that lineage of learning so that at least you know what you can do what what people have been trying to do what people have been trying to express on this instrument for for you know years going back then you can decide what you want to do with it because i knew i wasn't going to be a classical clarinet player but i knew yeah. i just wanted to i wanted to connect myself to the history of learning the clarinet you know because i was interested yeah. in that instrument and i think it did quite a profound thing to my you know, to, to my kind of sense of abandon. Because what it meant going forward is that, you know, like the music that I, I, I kind of went to just after finishing university was free improvisation. You know, I was a part of a group called the London Improvisers Orchestra. Um, Cafe Otto had just started, so they were doing loads of improvising music, you know, like people like um, Steve Beresford, Evan Parker, yeah. Paul Cox Hill was around. Um, and that, the whole ethos was, you want to take your technique and you want to use it. You want to use it like functionally. You want to use it for the, for the purpose of interacting with people, you know, for the purpose of actually trying to communicate, you know, societally on the bandstand, you know? So almost like doing that classical training, having that classical background was something that allowed me to have the confidence to actually make my instrument sound horrible. <laughs> you know, it's like sometimes I'll go onto the stage and I'll, you know, even just the whole thing of going, I'm not playing music. I'm blowing the saxophone as hard as possible. You know, I feel like I can, I can go to a big festival stage or I can go to some big arts institution and I can play the saxophone like someone who's never even seen a saxophone in his life who's just been told blow a piece of metal. You know? <laughs> and the reason I can do that is because I have no self-confident issues in playing, <laughs> you know. Yeah, uh, I think that that lack of self confidence, um, that that self confidence, comes from having that background where I know I can play the instrument objectively, you know, um, to the kind of degree that's that's been told in our time is is proper playing, you know, in inverted commas, you know. Yeah, the inverted quotation. That's the same way within fashion. It's like, or in art, or in architecture. It's like, I realized my freedom came from having a knowledge and investigating that while I was younger mm. and, and dealing with the rhetoric and the reason why this is the proper way, as in you're saying, like play the sax. Yeah. But the freedom comes when it's like, that's not a rule, you know? And the freedom comes when you define your own signature. It was very much in the same way. I was like, I want to do shows in Paris, but I want the models to wear clothes that I see people wear in the street. Mm. You know, I want it to reflect the the nuances that was happening in New York, Lower East Side, with the movement of streetwear there, or in Los Angeles on Fairfax, or just the regular people that you'd see in Chicago riding the train. Mm. You know, there's a natural style to that. And I wanted the institution to sort of realize that something has happened outside the institution, and that this offering is like a, as a perspective. So yeah, the parallels are there. 
I wanted to play one of my favorite songs from Sons of Kemet, uh, My Queen is Harriet Tubman, just for the people that are following me to like hear the sax. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think that's like we're sitting in front of uh, an audio system. So I'm going to play a piece of it and then I want like you to present the music as how you derived it mm. and how, how it articulates what we've been talking about over the last hour. My Queen is Harriet Tubman. Yeah, the title, yeah, the right. concept for the album, and specifically, like, what we've been discussing, how can the listeners at home sort of, like, digest, you know, that song? Well, I mean, that song in particular, I wanted to get the feeling of carnival in the Caribbean, you know? Like, when I, when I grew up in the Caribbean, that, that, that once a year kind of celebration, you know, the celebration that goes all the way back to slavery times. The, the, they call it the crop over um, carnival. Yeah. And that's the, literally the period where the harvesting of the crops has been done. And we get like three days to a week to celebrate. So the whole island, you know, from, you know, say for the last 300 years has been <laughs> celebrating this symbolic period of the work is over and now we can have a good time. And there's yeah. that feeling of the whole island is together in one into party. Like everyone loves the same song. Everyone loves Calypso and Soka. And they're yeah. these big trucks that are driving down the street, down, you know, through a kind of like parade path. Um, and everyone's just behind them. There's it's total uh, engagement. And this is something that I found different in the carnivals when I came to England, seeing the representations of the carnivals here. It, yeah. feel, it felt always like there's a level of detachment that From you the, don't you don't have it yeah in the caribbean it feels less like you've got observers it feels like everyone is participating there aren't Community. any people yeah there aren't any people seeing it as a culture that's other to them you know yeah, where, yeah. and that's the feeling i want to get with the music that that feeling like there is no other everyone is involved in this you know in this kind of cacophony yeah and what yeah, i hear I mean, is like the sonics mm. you know like you're not it's not like listening music like by it playing at its natural volume you're already sort of like embraced yeah by it. 
I mean, on that tune, we had three drummers. We actually had Moses, <laughs> Moses Boyd as the third drummer on that on that tune. Yeah, yeah. Amazing so, I mean, drummer. There's something that quite profound that happens when you get well from one to two drummers, and then two to three, something big happens. One to two drummers, um, they start to have a conversation. You yeah. Know, the rhythm goes. The the rhythm gets implied by their by their communication. When you add a third drummer what happens is that everyone stops, stops feeling like they have to provide a rhythmic underpinning. People oh. can stop, people can add things. It becomes that the drummers are painting. You know, the drummers are deciding how they're gonna um, interact with the landscape as opposed to seeing their interaction as a given. Wow. You know, and so, that's like, yeah, that's super profound. Mm. It's, it, you know, it's, are there three practice. drummers on the whole album, or just no on like half of the album? Yeah, so that tune. Um, I think my queen is Ada Eastman is two. Angela, my queen is Angela Davis is also two. Uh, my queen is Albertina Sisulu is also three drummers. Uh, yeah. but just for the listeners, if they don't know um, the concept of the album, the album was called "My Queen Is Your Queen Is a Reptile," and each tune is dedicated to a powerful woman throughout history. You know, subsequently, as I've talked about it in interviews, I've realized that all those women were black. But I swear, I didn't. <laughs> it, it didn't. I didn't go out to name 10 powerful black women. It's just yeah. that in researching women who I think have been inspirational, those stories were the ones that stuck, that stuck with me and they all happened to be black. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and the idea, like, your queen is a reptile, it's like, you know, I wanted that provocation, you know, with a statement like that. Even if, you know, you can see it in whatever, you know, whatever light you want, but it, it makes you have a response. It makes you go, you're silly or no, or how dare you, or so it makes you do something. And it's that space that of just slightly decentering the, yeah. the, the norm, the normal kind of um, stream of hierarchy. And yeah. then inserting, well, my queen is Angela Davis, my queen is Harriet Tubman, my queen is Albertina Sassoulou. Um that's what we're trying to trying to get to because I mean the the, the idea of hi hierarchy is something that that is made by consent by consent or domination yeah you know? so in basically saying no your queen is a reptile it's saying that that construct that psychological construct that keeps us pinned to the idea of monarchy is something that we can ascribe to anything you know exactly. we just need to consent to it you know so i'm saying no your queen is a reptile and my queen is angela davis what are you <laughs> going to say otherwise and if you're going to say that what are the qualities of your uh, of the leadership you know like one of the, the things that the monarchy is really good at doing in britain is is acting as if history in itself is the fact of their existence wow you know <laughs> It's not, it's not something that needs to be not something that needs to be renegotiated. And for me, this is <laughs> the thing about leadership. You need to renegotiate it. You need to always have the consent of the people that you're you are leading. You know. Yeah, it would be like you know Apple saying we're only going to do the first generation iPhone. Like yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's Steve the Steve Jobs touched this. Do not update it. It needs and it like you're saying it needs to be renegotiated at each point. Yeah. that humanity has decided to add more to its design and with this like natural path of continually updating the outside world the the system has to change as yeah. well and it's updating how we see the outside world like what meaning the outside world has you know like if you watch a movie when you were 15 you get a different meaning to it than if you watch it when you're 30 and I'm sure a different meaning than when you watch it when you're 40. And you've watched the same phenomena, you've watched the same sequence of scenes, but because of your experience, because of your life journey, you've got a different reaction to it. And for yeah. me, that's what we're trying to do musically, artistically. We're trying to always keep our, the stories that we have in our head of what we've seen, the scenes that we know, we're trying to keep them updated. We're, yeah. As soon as I start referencing a an idea with the with the mind state that i've had in the past it, there's always some kind of juncture where i'm not you know i'm not in it you know yeah me. yeah super wild and the, the subcontext is like you, you, for me this is something that i'm like is sticking with me at this moment is this idea i just wonder in the uk this sort of like epiphany that was 
happening in the sort of US of like, hey, we need to be more diverse and more mm. inclusive. Is that is that also in the UK as well? Like this, mm. like, or is it not such a marketing byline or something? I think the US is definitely its own specific beast in that sense. In that, I, I think the answer is yes, it, it is an issue in terms of the questions about inclusivity and the questions of diversity, but they're manifested in a different way because our histories are different, you know? Yeah. Um, the, the hist and the legacy, like the amount of time that, you know, black people have been in, in Britain as in large numbers is different, you know, is different from, from America. Um, I don't know. Like, it's it's a it's a tough one to say because it's you can't really mention one without one without the other. I can't talk about the the diversity you know issue in in Britain in relation to America. Yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's just something in and of itself. We can talk about how things have progressed on British terms, and maybe how it looks mirroring to America. But for me, the two things are are, are totally different in in terms of the what the tensions is. are. Yeah. yeah. Um, the kind of racial tensions that you that you have in America, I feel, are different because Americans have a different temperament to Britain, and maybe they come from the same historical underpinning of white supremacy and colonialism, but the manifestations of them, how those tensions, those racial tensions, um, show themselves, are different. You know, and for yeah. me, like the trying to equate one to another creates like secondary problems. You know, yeah. we can learn from them. We can definitely learn from them, but yeah. yeah That's end. why in your, in your sort of rationale around adding three drummers. Yeah. You know, and, and the sort of, you know, that's why I firmly believe in like young black culture is that with intellectual conversations such as this, like, and with very much more sort of like purposeful work mm. that, we're collectively adding a third drummer to the sort of overall ecosystem. Mm. You know, like there's batons that can be passed, there's layers of work that can be made. You know, again, I'm an optimist. So I believe as, all, as long as there's a connection and thankfully, you know, obviously when I bring up my Pop Smokes story, why it's fundamentally amazing is that youth black culture in America and in London, in my mind, since I've been young, have never been as close or that obviously has more room to grow. But I think there's a synergy happening through music mm. that is all of a sudden causing an, uh, causing a sharing to happen. And, you know, I made my career by traveling, by being in different scenes and like making myself physically available to share ideas and, you know, break boundaries but also learn i think that you know the future as we both discussed in our first hour is it, it, this is a renaissance you know by every performance you're converting more people by us connecting in a hotel lobby and me listening to that album and sort of you know immediately having this level of conversation i think is one thing and now look we're sharing like three thousand people two thousand people are are hearing us ramble yeah, about yeah. about the things that inform our work and our creative practice but you know those are minds being opened hmm. and going out to this world and making new work yeah this, this like south african proverb and just like paraphrasing but it goes whenever there are two people in a room there's a third um the presence of the ancestors you know, wow. and when if you consider the ancestors to be a body of knowledge, you know, a body of experience that those two people are bringing to the room. Also, I feel like that's what it is when we get these, you know, transatlantic exchanges. We it's just it's not just me and you talking. It's me, you and the experiences that each of us have had that intersect, you know, and it's you know, it's it's something special. It's like that's for me the, the basis of ancestral worship is knowledge and experience and how they projected through time and who does the projecting and who does the, the archiving of that projection you know yeah and like the more that we share the more that we acknowledge that kind of common ancestral link you know the more that we actually have that the power to do projecting of, of, of ourselves you know yeah and i think you know as we get to this higher chair conversation the epiphany that came 
is that the oral history is is as powerful and almost you know it's the essence of what like what seemingly is on the pedestal of like higher education or or sort of institutionalized learning you know and the more that these oral histories are happening you know from investigations turning into can our own canons especially within black art or black creativity it's it, we're making our own institution that mm -hmm. probably is more poised to be shared amongst boundaries amongst sort of uh you know amongst the sort of hopefully an epiphany to remove prejudice or at least embarking on that um that'll further us as a society yeah that's what it is like how do you how do you communicate with knowledge you know how do you engage with it how do you make it you know going back to what we said at the beginning of the conversation how do you make history and knowledge a living a living vessel you know something that actually you 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 manipulate and you you shape as you move through it you know yeah. that you know in finding in finding that malleability you've got to find new new ways of, of containing it you know and that's what interests me how do we contain the new knowledge that we've created you know the new ways of being the new ways of, of seeing stuff um and these are just questions that are it's like they're addressed through our art you know that's the, yeah. the the privilege that we have we can ask these questions and then the result is our job <laughs> you know yeah <laughs> yeah and that's you know my the my obsession with fashion is purely linked to that it's written in the archives mm. of of time but also it's written in the hollowed archives that exist within paris right you know mm -hmm. it's almost my my impetus to create is that these ideas are being written somewhere in a safe place yeah, yeah. you know like if you go to the year 2002 you can or you know you see what was happening at the time and uh, i imagine it has to be the same way with your album you know you, you make an album and it, it's it's sort of frozen in that sort of space what do you like to answering the question you just proposed like how do and this is like a good question for us to sort of probably ramp out on is like what what should we do within our practice to sort of cement the ideas so that they're there for others to find uncover and so that they actually affect the course of archive knowledge mm. i think it's about writing about it you know like and i say that without it writing being metaphorical writing as in actually like literally, <laughs> literally writing this i've been doing it recently through this lockdown period i've got on my notepad and i've been writing and i've found that there's a different i have a different thought process and a different way of engaging with my ideas when i take a physical piece of paper and i write ideas onto it um, yeah and in doing that um I'm like writing about what I do. I'm, I'm writing about how I feel about my music and, and almost my journey, like kind of writing an autobiography, you know? Yeah. And it's this, you know, for me, this is what artists should be doing, all artists, you know? This is what I think I wish I'd done. It's almost like keeping a musical diary because it becomes archive. It becomes living, you know, it becomes something that can state the record. And the more voices and the more depictions of, of black art that we have, the more nuanced the tree becomes. You know, that center of, of knowledge, like who determines what the, the zeitgeist is, who determines like what the spirit of the London jazz scene is at the moment. It'll be left to historians. Whereas what would happen if Nubaya was writing her thoughts while she's on the roads, Moses was writing his thoughts, Femi from yeah. the Ezra Collective, everyone's just documenting how they're thinking and what they're trying to do and what their utopias are and what their visions are. And there was some way of then uploading it, you know, to a public, yeah. to a public archive. You know, for me, that's the way that we can move forward culturally when actually there is this, yeah, a kind of living and breathing archive that everyone can engage with. It's not stuck in, it's not stuck in, in academia and it's not stuck inside of the performers' heads. It's kind of it's out there. <laughs> that's the mark that, you know, like, you know, I love obviously people tuning in. It's like we're just 
theorizing, talking about in abstract terms, but that the whole conversation comes to a specific point mm. that we form a be formally believe in. And that to me, you know, it has to be words and thoughts on a piece of paper becomes the intersection point for it to be open source information for more people to sort of have these sort of critical moments of epiphanies. Mm. And, you know, and I think about that specifically in like modes of black production is, is, is that whatever is happening culturally, you know, you talked about just the carnivals that are ha happening for 300 years and that sort of synergy that exists on that specific day that exists within that sort of context. And obviously carnival in UK and Notting Hill means something completely different, but your perspective on it through all the hours that you spend on a saxophone or a clarinet, you know, boiling down to some words that leave less sort of ambiguity. Mm. And it falls in the same, you know, every friend that I find along my travels, along my lifetime that I believe is giving valuable information, A, I encourage them to produce work. You know, mm. too, too often there's the, there's in contemporary society, there's this sort of this knowledge build up and then there's this like, uh, fear of executing or putting it out or putting mm -hmm. it out in abundance, especially within black youth, black production is in, in just in general, it doesn't matter the race. It's, it's a, there's, mm -hmm. there's too many critics <laughs> yeah. and not enough creators. This actually leads us like, you know, I know it's supposed to wrap up, but it leads us to a point in this, this one of the other books in the reading, the John yeah. Page. Well, one of the things he talks about in here is, um, the the creative process being dissected into slight into different modes so he sees the composition as a different whole mode as the listening the listening is a different mode to no the the the, the composition as a different mode to the performance the performance is a different mode to the listening but all of those three being intertwined in ways that aren't that aren't obvious so if you see those as like what I do to compose is an entity in itself. What the listener gets out of it is an entity to itself. What the performer does, the, the, the kind of technical process of what the performer does is something of himself. It means that you have to compose. You know, it's not composing in accordance to what the listener is going to get from it, because that's something that's in another realm altogether. It's not creating music in accordance to what happens in terms of um, who's ingesting it. You know, yeah. for me, it's about going, you're producing because of that world of production. You know, you're producing for the community, you know. Um, yeah. You know, and that, that whole kind of schema of things, you know. It's, yeah, it, it, it's, yeah, we just need more, yeah, more, more production almost. You know? <laughs> um, but I think it's, yeah, more production, but also like analyzing, mm -hmm. you know, like one of my friends in the chat, someone who I admire a lot, Venus X is a, amazing DJ artist, you know, she's an advocate for, for sort of shining light on, on those that are sort of pouring passion into their art form and thinking about it on these terms. So like that the overall ecosystem has, has, has those voices in position like willing to be heard. Mm. And it all boiled that, you know, boil that down to community. You know, I think that's the vital part about why we're even on this like weird piece of technology talking for going on two hours. Mm -hmm. It's that like taking the derivative up, all these like high level terms or things that we found, nothing supersedes community and oral stories. Yeah. It's like, that's the real, like, of course people think money, politics or, sort of access to wealth or success or etc legitimately nothing in the world is more valuable than conversation and mm. that it's that it's archived yeah you know that it doesn't float away you know like that's why i'm going to tell you to hit save on this video oh, yeah. afterwards <laughs> and i hit i think i hit save you know we got it saved, but i think that these these aren't casual conversations, you know? Mm. This is something that can hopefully like spur on change. Yeah, 
you know, and it will, because people are listening to it and interpreting it and taking what they want from, from the conversation. Yeah. Um, you know, last, the very last thing I'll just add before we go. Um, yeah. It's a concept that I've, I've come upon recently in looking at a lot of comedic wisdom, the idea of separate, the idea of the subjective realm and the objective realm, but not the subjective realm in what we normally see as subjective, not objective. The subjective realm being the realm before things are formed. You know, the objective yeah. realm being things that have formed themselves into definites. So, for instance, you're fishing for an idea within, in your head, you know, about, about something. You're fishing for an opinion within what? Within the subjective realm before it's formed into a codified, you know, vision of, of, of something. So, for me, it's like when things move into the objective realm of, like, concise thoughts, they're put into packages of semantics, you know, they're put in, <laughs> and those semantics have historical and racial stigmas attached to it. So what happens if the thought that someone has is given in a package that historically has been said to be less um, worthy than others, you know? So what happens when someone is rapping a musical idea that, but rappers being told to be not as high art form as minimalist composition music. Yeah. Is the idea itself is that idea that's picked from the subjective realm of less importance than that the music that we call high art because it's semantic, you know, like underpinning has been ascribed more value throughout history. Yeah. And once those kind of thoughts start to you start to like dissect them, then all of a sudden the world takes on a different meaning because you're not forming meanings from historical correlations you're forming meaning from the, the things itself the ideas themselves you know but you know our second task <laughs> the epiphany is like when all this sort of the taking the subjective realm and making it a canon mm. you know thereby i think sort of takes takes the sort of formalized practice that hey it has to have come from this lineage or way of thinking to be exalted on a higher pedestal. Exactly. And then writes a new language. So like each in, in our own practice within fashion or art or music, I think we can even work smarter about work in parallel with the practice, sort of make, make the sort of fluid and the subjective actually what's as valuable as as cool you know like this might get into another hour tangent but like what i've noticed within especially with black art black production or the black the black cosine is extremely valuable on a total scale right like mm -hmm. it actually spurs along commerce in unprecedented the first day the first time jay-z name dropped a certain brand all of a sudden that reverence is is fused into sort of a, like a major realm of relevance mm. you know that that actually changes the whole ecosystem of things that we'll never know or the first time dapper dan says hey i'm gonna buy this fabric and i'm gonna make this jacket and i'm gonna give it on big daddy kane to wear in a video composing a black image says you know you sort of taken a shortcut to culture in a very specific way and then those things live on images they live in the hearts and minds of like a community and they sort of reoccur in history and they become more valuable so today you know it's a little bit of a tangent but it's saying how the more efficient sort of idea of archive creating archiving and contextualizing in what is seen as like a you know as you say like lower art form can actually find a shortcut to be sort of placed in a position where contemporary society values it and respects it. Mm. No, most definitely. Like in our lifetime type movement, yes. <laughs> not like something from the past. And I think that's the ancestor, like you're saying, it's like the ancestors of our two-way conversation, like informing new thoughts. Yeah. Informing new thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> zigzag well cool i think this talk has been very very good i think the longer it goes the more people will lose <laughs> <by Yeah. the> <laughs>
but it's good to link up. Yeah, you too, man. Yeah, thanks for having me with me. Yeah. yeah. As we finish off, tell people where to find the music. Obviously, they'll find you on your page. Or, or what are you going to do? Let's get a bit realistic. What are you going to do at the, uh, like, to ride out the rest of these weeks? Are you, in, are, you in, are you comfortable? Are you in panic mode, making music, reading, um, writing? I'm having an artistically great time in that I've got a <laughs> lot of stuff. I've got so much stuff to do now that I've been realizing that my touring had been distracting me from a lot of work. You know, a lot of work that takes like kind of continual focus, you know, even work in terms of like checking out certain books, checking out certain artists, they hold discographies. So I'm yeah. just spending every day like just working on stuff. I've got a commission uh, for the London Sinfonietta that should be due towards the wow. end of the year. So I'm writing that. Um, and then we, we finished recording a new Sons of Kemet album just before the lockdown. So oh, then crazy. they're kind of like having going forth between me and um, Dylan Harris, who produces all the, the albums, um, getting the mix done, basically. So Crazy. So there's an album. So now you're work, you can work on the mix. Exactly. In peace. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Without yeah. having to be on tour and all that. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. Well, no, it's been an honor. I'm glad, you know, for me, this is more, more fulfilling than, you know, outputting on the regular format of like, here's a new sneaker, or here's a new shoe, or here's a, a new collection. It's because, you know, I realize that most people don't get to hear the, pe the like from the content that mm -hmm. they subscribe to, they don't get to hear the logic. So, you know, this talk definitely hit that mark and yeah, it should be the first of many. Let's catch up soon and keep going. Yeah, yeah, definitely, man. Keep going. Yeah, stay safe. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. Peace. Peace. Cool.